It is a monumental teaching on the human person known as the theology of the body. St. John Paul II said that the question before modern man is who man will be for woman and who she will be for him. To get this question right is to get marriage and family right. In turn is to get civilization right. And we can translate this question as why are we men? Why are we young? I mean the real why. Knowing the why of something is the only reliable way to truly come to know the how of something. To discern the ultimate why behind anything, in this case the human person as male and female, requires us to retrieve something vital that has been progressively lost over recent centuries in modern Western civilization. It is the sense of the mystical. G.K. Chesterton says, mysticism is what keeps men sane. <laughs> the mystical means what is most real, what something is in its essence, how it points to or manifests a reality beyond itself. The mystical calls us to look at life through the lens of what I'll refer to as the sacramental, liturgical world, and then to simply live according to that vision. The Judeo-Christian tradition teaches that the human person is made in the image and likeness of God. Consequently, the starting point of the answer to our question of why man and why woman has to be understanding of God. Christianity understands God to be one God in three distinct persons, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, who form together a union and communion of persons. God is relational within himself. And this is a relationship of perfect deferential love. The second person of this triune God, while never leaving the Trinity, incarnated himself in the very order of creation that he himself set in place. God became man while still remaining God. The invisible is now made visible. The invisible is now made visible precisely and only through the physical. So profound a mystery, so profound an act of love can only be described through analogy. Yet any analogy was still fall short. The most common analogy in the whole of Judeo-Christian tradition, and indeed in the fathers and liturgy of the church, is that of nuptials. God created the bride and entered into intimate spousal union with his bride. Complementarity, the spousal mystery, now becomes the very DNA of the entire created order. It is woven throughout all of nature, most especially to the nature of the human person. Since God is relational within himself, and he enters into spousal union with his bride, and the human person is made in the image of this God, it only follows that the human person is also made for relationship, intimacy, for union, and communion. We are made to share in the very anterior life of the Trinity, to love as God loves. And we participate in this love and life by virtue of being made man and woman, male and female. It is stamped in the language and theology of our very bodies precisely because they are sexual. As St. John Paul II said, the body and it alone makes visible what is invisible. To the language of the body, man and woman can make a free, full, faithful, and fruitful gift of self to each other. Now the physiology of the female body is designed around a series of concentricities. You know, it's round. This speaks the language of connectedness, integration, relationship. The woman accommodates the environment. She brings things together to the center. She is the enstatic one who interiorizes. The theology of her body makes visible an invisible God who is imminent, relational, loving, and tender. Unique to her feminine body is the womb, a sacred space deep inside of her, which of its very nature as an open space speaks of being filled Therefore, pointing to what St. John Paul II said is the genius of woman. 
her gift of receptivity. In this way, not only does the theology of her body point to the imminent and relational God, but also womanhood becomes the very archetype of the human race. For the human race, being the mystical bride of God, was designed to stand in a posture of receptivity to God's love. In complement to womanhood, a male body acts upon the environment. Man is more ecstatic, external. In the words of Orthodox theologian Paul of Dokimo, man moves out of himself, extends and enlarges himself through his energies, inseminates, actualizes, and builds. Masculine nature is expressed on a level of deeds that project him beyond himself. Tools lengthen the arm of man, the worker. The gaze of the man is further, more single focused than that of woman, his brain more compartmentalized. If the physiology of the woman makes visible and invisible imminent relational God, the language of the male physiology speaks of a God who is external to us, out there, awesome, transcendent, separate, the righteous judge, the powerful one, the author of the order of creation. The ultimate why behind our being man and woman is that in our complementarity, we mystically make present a God who is righteous, transcendent, at the same time, imminent and relational, the lover of mankind. It is precisely through the complementarity of maleness and femaleness that man and woman can become a union and communion of persons, at the same time be fruitful. Precisely as male and female, the human person participates in the very interior life of the Holy Trinity and can love as God loves. Retrieving the ultimate, ultimate mystical why behind our male and female by reading the language and theology of the body through the lens of the sacramental clues us into both our respective vocations and our legitimate needs as man and woman. This in turn guides us to the how of being man and woman for each other. The sacral liturgical worldview also clues us into our greatest fears as man and woman. As the crowning and final act of God's creation, womanhood ushers into visible reality the order of life and love. Woman gives the world a soul. Womanhood makes human culture. The human person has been entrusted to her in a special way. Stamped, therefore, in the very language of her body is her greatest need as a woman to be relationally fulfilled. Her greatest fear is abandonment, to be relationally disconnected, unfulfilled. Man, on the other hand, is designed for accomplishment, mission, defending, penetrating, and protecting. The language of the male body speaks of a man's greatest need as a man, is to receive a message first from his father, then from the male world in which he develops, then from his beloved. It is a message that he is adequate, reliable, capable, the man for the job. At his baptism in the River Jordan, even Jesus Christ hears the voice of his Father moving from the heavens. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. It is then that Jesus embarks upon his mission. The man needs an adventure to live, a battle to fight, a woman to live and die for. He responds to a mission like the words of the prophet Isaiah, send me, send me. Man's greatest fear, therefore, is failure, loss of power, and adequacy. It is this message of failure and uselessness that men are receiving in modern Western civilization as the evil one's quest to dismantle God's word of creation to break down manhood and thus to make womanhood, his ultimate target, completely vulnerable. It was in the beginning of the Garden of Eden, so it is now. The mystical context for the why and how of being male and female is found in the liturgy of the church, in her art, architecture, prayer, and ritual. The womb of womanhood is the tabernacle of the human race the meeting point between heaven and earth. If the womb is a tabernacle, the bedroom is the sanctuary. What goes on there determines the rise and fall of civilization. Modern civilization has dismissed God and the church and the bedroom, defiled the tabernacle of the human race with contraception and abortion. Now, laws and ideology 
in modern Western civilization seek to blur the essential complementarity of the created order. In this way, modern Western civilization is committing demographic suicide. Designed to spend itself on behalf of beloved, manhood is by nature priestly. As the priest is the steward of the tabernacle, so it is, so too it is the essential vocation of manhood to protect the intrinsic dignity and holiness of womanhood, to protect the tabernacle, to protect her womb. In the words of Abdelkimo, man the overseer sacramentally penetrates the elements of the world in order to consecrate them and transform them into the kingdom of God. Classic church architecture adopted the nuptial character of the ancient Jewish temple with a separation of the Holy of Holies, the nuptial chamber, from the rest of the temple. It was in the Holy of Holies that the bridegroom Yahweh would meet the bride Israel. So only the high priest, personifying both bride and bridegroom, was permitted to enter the once a year. In classic Christian churches, the altar and sanctuary were set off in the nave, and only the priest entered as the only one authorized to approach the tabernacle, only for the holiest of reasons. The altar became the nuptial bed upon which the consummation of mystical marriage between Christ the bridegroom and his bride the church would occur in the Eucharist. The Eucharist in turn finds its context on Calvary, on the cross, where Christ, now the new Adam, looks down at his mother, now the new Eve. He does not call her mother, but woman, Woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. On the bed of the cross, the human race would be mystically reconceived. Through the Paschal season, Eastern churches, such as here in Georgia, proclaim Christ has emerged from the tomb like a bridegroom from the bridal chamber and filled the women with joy. This same language of self-donation is spoken in the language of the hours of the body during the one flesh union between husband and wife. From bedroom to Eucharist to Calvary to the wedding feast of the Lamb in heaven, the spousal mystery is the DNA of the entire created order, and it provides the why and the how of who man is for woman, who woman is for man. Modern man must once again don sacramental liturgical glasses and see the human person mystically to truly know who man should be for woman and woman should be for man is to get marriage and family right. In turn, is to get the whole world right. Thank you.